cool, cool. Well then, just m- going back, going back, way, way, way back, just to start things here, who first got you into music? What's, you know, what was the first memories of music you had? You know, when did the passion start for you? Oh, always. I mean, uh, my parents were big into music, so it was always something I heard in the house. You know, they had like, you know, I started off personally with like little kid records, like Disneyland records and shit like that. And, you know, all yeah. those. My, actually, my, my grandparents, 78 speed records, I used to listen to those like, you know, like Looney Tunes records and like Bozo the Clown records and stuff like that, like 78 speeds, you know? Yeah. And then uh, my parents had, they had a bunch of, of stuff on, on record, like they're kind of broad in their taste. They had like Beatles, they had, you know, Beethoven, they had Bo Diddley, the three Bs, um, like some bluegrass stuff and like some jazz. They're, you know, kind of all over the place and as soon as I was responsible enough to to use the record player, you know, I put yeah. on like Beatle records and stuff. So, um, so that was that's how I got into music by being surrounded by it. But the the thing that that got me into my own music was discovering Kiss mm. as a little kid. And that was like the game changer. You know, it's like, oh, this isn't my, my parents' music, which was great, you know, but yeah. this is like Your own next thing. level. That yeah, that kicked the door open right there. So that was. That was a big one, you know? Right, right. And then you finally got into the heavier stuff. I'm assuming at that point, it's all the standard stuff, Sabbath type stuff, or was it, or was it anything different that kind of led you to the, to the heavier stuff, the heavier world? I mean, there wasn't any stuff yet, you know, besides Black Sabbath, <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, I mean, this is like when I first started getting into my own music, it was 1978, you know, so there was, I mean, Black Sabbath, but, yeah. you know, besides like some new wave of British heavy metal coming out i had no clue about any of that stuff you know it wasn't it was you know not something that was common or where where when i was you know so yeah. i was into like besides kiss like you know aerosmith acdc cheap trick stuff like that and then uh when i discovered black sabbath a little bit later my probably like 1980 i'm guessing you know i got paranoid at a flea market for 25 cents and it looked cool <laughs> like oh what's this yeah. And uh, Alice Cooper around that time. So I didn't know anything about like metal. There really wasn't too much metal. But next thing you know, I discovered Iron Maiden and then like Motorhead and stuff. So that was like the heaviest stuff I could find. Right. And then, then it was just a progression, you know, of like always chasing the heavy. You know, there was, like I said, like Iron Maiden, Motorhead and Saxon. And then, then all of a sudden I discovered record stores that carried imports and that was huge and then you discover all sorts of other things like oh you know raven and bodine and accept and loudness and all this Mm -hmm. stuff and then next you know venom comes around and then slayer comes around and possessed and all that and the rest is history (laughs) (laughs) it was just a lot of progressive line of, of of following the heavy things i could find right 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 yeah you uh you mentioned loudness, man. That, I haven't. That's a band I have not listened to in a long time. I, I had gotten in. I have not listened to a lot of their stuff, but um, God, what's the one album? It's got like the green on the front. Um, well, like Devil Soldier. Or, yes, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a, I forget who led me to that one, but um, that's the only one I know by them. But I, I, I loved it, man. That was it was a more recent find for me. I'm a, I'm a lot younger, but so you know. Yeah, anyways, that just made me think of that. That's a great one. Uh, it's never too late to uh, catch up on that stuff. Yeah, that's old loudness stuff. is killer. Yeah, yeah. So, and then I know from 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 hearing, I, I've talked to a bunch of people in death, I've done a whole series on death and all that. I, I know you were familiar with the demos that were going on at the time, like you had heard uh, the death demo, demos before. So when? how did you find out about demos? When did you get into that? Like, with you know, hooking up with them or, or, or trading the demos or, or you know, like all that demos stuff. in general or the death demos just in general um, yeah there, just in general there was a, like by any any source any source possible i mean there are several ways to go about it you know i mean one was just like your buddies telling you about it you know like oh sent off for this and it showed up in the mail you know um that was one mm. just like word of mouth by your you know your metalhead friends you know and then um another was once fanzines started coming around, you know, I discovered like fanzines, not like circus and hip parader and all that shit, you know, but actual like fanzines. Yeah. That was a big one because 
a lot of the time there'd be advertisements in there, bands selling their selling their wares, you know, or an article about a band and it, it told you where you could order their demo. So there was that, you know, just like mail order and stuff like that. And then there was also a couple of record stores that I, I like to go to. Neither one's around anymore, but there's the record vault in San Francisco and a place called the record exchange in Walnut Creek. That was kind of like our local ish uh, places that sold imports and stuff like that. And, and some of them would sell demos under the counter. Um, and that was cool. Like my first band I was in like the uh, record exchange sold our demos. So that was cool. I was like under the best. counter, like, like they weren't displaying, you had to ask for it or like, Oh no, like just sort what? of like, you know, glass case <laughs> or the cash, cash okay. register is, you know, just kind of sitting there. Yeah. Um, and then yeah. the record vault did this thing where they would sell tapes, like, like a 60 or 90 minute tape. And it would just have, a bunch of demos on it like you told a bootleg you know there'd be like five or six demos just mm -hmm. on this one tape and they'd have this homemade cover that was like a page out of like a creepy comics magazine or something like that and so i got a whole bunch of demos like that like you buy a tape for five bucks or whatever it was and have demos from like sodom and destruction and artillery and king diamond before he had his you know uh album contract oh, no way. um <laughs> yeah high racks and fucking just you name it you know all, all creator all when they were called tormentor all sorts of things like that so that was another good resource yeah so and then once a little bit later once i started making my own demos and you know circulating the underground scene and you like trade with other bands you know like just reach out to other bands or vice versa mm -hmm. and like trade each other's demos and stuff like that. So just, there's a whole bunch of ways to go about it and just anything that, that made it happen, I was down for, Right. you know, and then once the death metal stuff started happening, then it was like a flood of demos, you know, then it was just like trading with other bands like crazy, you know, it just was yeah. unstoppable. So, uh, I, you know, I still, I still actually have all my demos too in a, oh, man. In a box in my garage that I don't know if they've, withstood years of this and that weather in there oh, yeah. <laughs> but uh <laughs> i still do have them um yeah so that's cool but hearing bands before they became big was cool you know like For sure you know the roots of, of the bands you know that was a pretty cool thing so um yeah a yeah. lot of stuff first nasty savage demo that was a good one um you know on and on right 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 yeah that's awesome. Yeah, I'm always fascinated by demos. I love looking up old bands' demos. I've got to do it on, you know, <coughs> YouTube nowadays because, you know, things are a little different. But I love to hear, they you know. there. You know, you can check them out. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's a little easier now, you know. But um, cool. Uh, so then so then I know, like I said, I know you you had heard, you know, the, the demos from uh, <coughs> Death or <coughs> those early Death demos <coughs> by the time you were, you know, getting into Death. From what I remember, correct me if I'm wrong. I think you there was a, Chuck put out an ad. Was that correct? And you responded to that. He was. A, I I don't know if the ad ever actually got placed. To be honest with you, okay. It was on a, a a local high school radio station that had a metal show, and uh, I had a friend of mine who who was a DJ on there. She had her own show, and um, one day she just came up to me and and told me that. Uh, someone called in some guy named Chuck who was looking to start a, a new lineup for death and was looking for, for band members. And he was going to have run an ad on, on the high school radio station, you know, if you can believe that. <laughs> and so she's like, yeah. yeah, she just said something like, Oh, I thought you might want to look into it. Here's his number. It just gave me a little piece of paper with his number on it. And I said, Oh, cool. So, and I already knew, knew about Dad and, you know, had read about them in fanzines and all that stuff and collected a few demos through various sources. And uh, I knew they were out of Florida, so I was, there was no way it was the same one. I was convinced it was not, it was some bizarre coincidence or something like that, but I knew, you know, deep down there's, there's no way it's the same guy. It's just not possible. But at the same time, I felt excitement because, you know, it's also like, well, what if? Yeah. <laughs> so I couldn't wait. I couldn't wait to get home and, and get on the phone, so I did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, he answered the phone. It was the same guy. I couldn't believe it. You know, it was too too wild. You know, I mean, talk about right place at the right time. Um, yeah. So I don't know if the ad – I mean, I basically jumped the line if ever there was to be a line, which back then there probably wouldn't have been anyways because 
death metal, at least where I was a teenager, was not cool. <laughs> there was a couple right. of people into it, but it was not cool. It was that was the the point where where like thrash was king, which is fine. But the thing was the Bay, the area. The majority of the, the people in the thrash, the bands and the fans really looked down on death metal and thought it was stupid. Okay. You know, okay. I, it was, it's, it's hard to explain now because it doesn't make sense, but I actually lost some friends over that move into death because people, <laughs> no seriously, cause they, they got mad because they're like, why, you know, I had one buddy try to tell me how great the band AHA was. He's like, what? <laughs> He's like, fucking AHA is good, man. What are you into this bullshit for? You can't understand the lyrics or anything. <laughs> You know, and that, yeah, and that's not really a good example, but like just the Bay Area, like the whole thrashing, <laughs> they just looked down on death metal because it wasn't political. You couldn't understand the lyrics. It wasn't mm. the lyrics weren't about moshing in the pit, you know, or anything like that. So it was really like right. frowned upon. But you wouldn't think case, that because just because it's like they were adding the extremity to what was before, you know, you would have thought of like, oh, here's the next thing, but obviously. It was they really ready like, for it. <laughs> kind of no, not ready for it. That happened, you know. It took a few years, but it eventually people got hip. But it was mm -hmm. very clicky at that point, you know. Like there was a lot of I like this, so I can't like that kind of thing. Sure, so, you know, and that went for punk and metal too. You know, like there was mixed shows all the time, like hardcore metal bands, and sometimes the crowds hated each other uh -huh. because of mus musical preference, which is. You know, now everyone is free like everything and not catch it for it, but it wasn't always yeah. that way. So getting back to the question, I don't know if anyone else heard that ad, but we couldn't find anyone else to, you know, we, we did everything, you know, from we put like paper flyers and guitar center, you know, looking for yeah. musicians and whatever, just nothing worked. We couldn't find anybody. It was just too... It was too much yeah. <laughs> for people at that time, right. I guess. <laughs> That's pretty funny. That's cool, though. So then, yeah. What, so then, when you guys met up and everything, you know, was there? Were you guys like pretty good friends after that? Was it more just like the band thing, or did you guys, you know, how did you guys get along and all that? Oh, we were like best friends at that at that time. You know, once we we got together and started jamming. I mean, the funny thing was, I I had kind of a fear before calling because I was. I just turned 17, so I was, like, pretty young. And, you know, seeing Chuck in, like, fanzines and all that, he, I was like, oh, he's got to be some, like, man of the world, you know, <laughs> some older, wise metal guy. <laughs> yeah. And I expressed that concern on the phone. I was like, well, shit, I got to tell him, you know. I was like, oh, just so you know, uh, this isn't a big deal, but I'm 17, just turned <laughs> 17. And I couldn't believe it. And he's like, oh, it's cool, man. I'm just 19, so, you know, it's no big deal. <laughs> so, te teenagers, you know, so fucking... uh once we started to get together and jamming and, and all that, we got to be like super good friends, you know, it was great. So, I mean, it was, it was just the two of us in the band right. who were kind of like cap captive audiences of each other. Right, right. So, I mean, that, that'll either, you know, bring you really close or, or uh, be a deal breaker and, you know, we got to be super close friends. What, uh, what kind of, what did you guys do? Like when you weren't, you know, writing music, did you guys hang out a lot just in general? There was, yeah. I mean, there was, that was some of the funnest stuff. You know, a lot of people want to hear all about the, album recording or demo recording and, and that's that's great but a lot of my favorite things to think about are just like stupid shit we get up to because <laughs> when we tried to make the album in florida I, I had no drum kit i couldn't bring it out with me i think i must i'm sure i flew out i don't really remember much about that but i couldn't fly my kid out and there wasn't one at chuck's parents house where we were staying so my my mom had the idea to send my drum kit by Greyhound bus because it was affordable. So we did that. Wow. So it took a couple of weeks for the, for my drums to show up. So we're in Florida with nothing to do and teenagers, nothing to do. We'll get up to some pretty goofy shit just to amuse ourselves. So it, yeah. um, just <laughs> anything from just going to the, the mall and running around and doing dumb shit, like running up the down escalators and down the up escalators <laughs> and getting cheap beer and hanging out. I don't even know how we bought the beer because neither one of us were of age. Um, right, right. Just a bunch of goofy shit, hang out, play fucking air hockey, watch a lot of horror movies. Nice. We go to the Albertsons grocery store that had a, a video rental section. They actually had a good horror section, so we watched a lot of horror movies. Yeah. Um, stuff like that. Um, just kind of hanging out, just getting up to bullshit, you know? Nothing, yeah. nothing bad, just dumb. The typical stuff. Yeah. Typical stuff. I mean, uh, 
one of the one of the fun things was <laughs> he had a, a poster of Nikki Six that came out of like a hit parader, and that became the uh, focus of a booger collection. So, <laughs> you know, we'd wipe our boogers on Nikki. And then, yeah. You know, um, you know, stuff to really be proud of. Until his mom <laughs> found the poster and threw it away one day, we're like, "Oh, Nikki's gone." His mom's like, "That was horrible. Don't ever do that again." So things like that. Right, 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 right. Oh, that's funny. Were you guys rehearsing? Was it at Chuck's parents' house mostly, or or, or, or what? Yeah, in the garage. I mean, we started off over when I met him over here. He was living over here. Oh yeah, we, right. we jammed in in my house where I lived with my mom and sister, and then he ended up going back to. It's a weird. It was a weird back and forth thing. He went back to Florida and I went with him with the intent of recording the album there. And so I stayed at his parents for the summer. Mm. And, um, in the, yeah, when we got there, we just, we played in the garage in the summer in Florida, hmm. you know, it was, it was, uh, a little warm. Right. Yeah. I can imagine. <laughs> it was, it was fucking brutal <laughs> as a matter of fact, but, um, yeah, so that's, that's where we played in the parents, his parents garage. Right, 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 right. That's cool. Now, I talked to uh, Steve DiGiorgio this year, and uh, we were talking about some of the death stuff. And I didn't realize it, but he was talking about how he was kind of like jamming. I guess, wait, this would have been when you guys were in California, though, right? Yeah. Um, playing some bass parts once in a while with you guys. Well, we had this idea of of Steve playing a live show with us. I've, I've, I heard something about how how he said he thought he was going to play on the album, but that's not anything that I remember. Yeah. Unless him and Chuck had a conversation that I wasn't aware of. He kind of phrased um, it to me like he just kind of hoped or, you know, he thought it would have been cool. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. Sense. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know Chuck and I was going to do the record ourselves, but around, around that time, we also had a thought of like, I would play a live show mm. and have Steve play, you know, cause he was also busy with say this. So we didn't really, I think we could ask him to leave Sadis yeah. and join us or whatever, but he was he was down to at least play live. And so um, he did learn the whole set, like, in no time flat, because that's how he is. He just learns yeah. stuff immediately. I mean, he's immensely talented, as everybody knows. Um, yeah. So he did learn the set, and we jammed it with him. Um, actually, in Sadis' house, uh, where Darren lived, we were jamming there, and uh, it sounded great. And that was... Right about the time where Chuck decided to go back to Florida again under the premise that he was going to go just visit his family. And then uh, time started going by and more time started going by and more started going by. And I was really wondering what was going on and where did I fit in at this point? And then he finally was like, hey, I'm, I'm here to stay. Yeah. Um, if you want to come move out, we can keep doing it. Otherwise, you know, whatever, you know. So uh, that was that was pretty much it. I didn't want to like move over there and rearrange my whole life, yeah. you know, and become a, a Florida citizen, even to stay in death, you know? So that was, that was, uh, the closing of the chapter of my time in the band. Yeah. Um, yeah. you know, so yeah, so there you go. Cool. I, uh, I was always wondering, you know, there's the two tracks that were left off of screen bloody gore. Yeah. Or at least the two that I know of, what, um, unholy grave and, uh, Legion of doom. Oh, wait, no, yeah. no, no, no. Oh, uh, I'm fucking, no, what do you call Something it? With an uh, L. Land, land of no return. That's it. I was like, it's an L. Yeah, yeah. Do you, okay, why I'm were those off? Do you up. remember? Uh, that was Combat's decision. We mm. we just gave them the whole thing with the intent of it being the album, and and they uh, made the executive decision to leave those two songs off. Okay. For whatever reason, I don't. They never, ex you know, they didn't explain things to us back then. They just did things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Well, that's kind of cool. It's like a, a nice treat for everybody later on when they finally were put out yeah yeah cool man well like sorry for going off so much on that i was you know, i went on a little bit of a death tangent there but uh oh no it's cool i'm happy to to relay uh whatever i remember from that stuff yeah no i appreciate it uh but getting into what i really wanted to talk about was then uh moving i know you did some stuff in between and then when you finally got together with your with the guys from autopsy danny and eric well i'm trying to remember who was the first bassist? Oh, that was Eric Igard. Okay, yeah, Eric and Eric, right, right, yeah. right. We had two Eric's, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So what what um, made you think that these were the guys for it, or what was the things that you guys were clicking on and connecting on where, like, this is going to definitely be the band? Uh, well, it was um, actually Steve DiGiorgio came into play again mm. because I, I was sitting there with no 
no band, you know, the, the death thing was over, you know, as far as I was involved, you know, so, and then I, I had a little uh, side gig with this band called Desecration over here, which was cool. I played a few shows with them. That was a whole nother little thing that was great. And then, uh, as that was coming to a close, cause they split up, I was, I didn't really know what to do, you know, sitting there without a band, but I can't be without a band for long. You know, it's just not how it works with me. So, I was talking to Steve Giorgio and he mentioned someone from the neighborhood that he knew, uh, some guy named Eric Cutler that, that's into metal. And that sounded cool. They were friends from like, school and whatnot. And so it turned out Eric lived like right next to where I lived. He lived across like a parking lot. Um, mm. I think there was like some condos being built. So you'd like walk through this little construction zone and there was his house. Oh, nice. And so I, I was told, I, I think I was just giving him his address or phone number or whatever. And uh, I just went over to his house, walked over there, and we just started talking about stuff and decided let's jam and, you know, maybe start our own band. Um, so it was just him and I at first. And then you know, we got a few songs down and stuff like that, just jamming at people's. We didn't have anywhere to rehearse, so just wherever we could practice, we did. And what that meant was waiting for a buddy's parents to leave town so we could set up in their living room. <laughs> And that's how, that's how we jammed back right. then. Cause we, you know, I lived in a condo and there's no way we could have like drums and shit set up. And Eric's parents didn't want us playing in their house. Although I think we did once or twice, but it was basically we would get a call from a friend in the neighborhood. Like, Hey, my folks are gone for the weekend. Let's, let's have a party and you guys jam, and, you know? So that's how we did that. But, and, and then uh, pretty soon Eric told me he knew a guy named Eric, who was another friend of his that played bass and, and we got him in the band. And so we were a three piece. We did the first demos of three piece. And then, uh, Danny came along, along in the summer of the, of the next year, which would have been 1988. Now that's kind of, I don't want, well, I don't want to say rare, but it, it, it's cool that it actually, those guys fit like with what, I mean, did you, I don't know if you had in mind what you want to do. I'm assuming you just, you knew you want to do something death metal or whatever, but the fact that, you know, the three of you guys have stayed this long and it clicked, you know, right away. Uh, you know, was there certain things that you knew was going to make it work? Like you guys, you know, similar bands that you were into or, 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 or what? Yeah. I mean, I guess that we didn't talk about really anything about like, would it work or not? Or yeah. what the future would be, you know, we're most of the time too busy trying to figure out who had weed. We go to their <laughs> house. You're like, Hey, how's it going? <laughs> Someone told me he had weed, so here we yeah. are at your doorstep. That was probably more what we were thinking about. So we didn't have any. <laughs> it's funny because it's true. Yeah. Um, uh, we didn't have any drive for the future or thoughts of the future or anything. It's just we're just busy living in the moment, you know, writing songs and and uh, a lot of listening to music, which which is very important mm. in in the band taking shape because we never talked about what we would sound like we were never like yeah we'll be death metal but we'll have a little slow to me parts that was never a conversation it just evolved because probably because of things that we were listening to you know we listened to like all the the fastest brutalist stuff we could find you know demos and this that and the other you know we had a lot of, of similar interests but one thing that we also liked a lot was was uh bands like you know black sabbath again um mm -hmm. and like trouble and candle mass and saint vitus and witchfinder general and stuff like that we were like really into the super heavy stuff and so i think without discussing it we just wrote riffs like that when we started writing our own songs like oh yeah. this heavy yeah. heavy and slow check it out so it was never like a, a plan or we didn't know what the fuck we were doing we just were having <laughs> having fun and making heavy music and hoping someone's folks go out of town for the weekend that was, right. that was about the you know as far as the a master plot that's as deep as it got you know things just we uh much like today we're very much a, a live in the moment band yeah well i mean that makes it so much more cool i mean there's nothing wrong to me with like we want to do this sound and we're going to go after that and try to make this sound happen but it's pr it's pretty cool that that's what came out naturally and it kind of i mean that's kind of how it sounds because it is i mean you got to be one of the most organic and natural sounding death metal bands to me you know it's it just doesn't sound like any other band out there you know which is hard to say for i mean back then that's what i loved about death metal from the early or the late 80s early 90s you know there was a lot of uniqueness still going on with it but uh 
I don't know, even to this day, it's hard to find a uh, an autopsy clone that's doing it like you guys, you know, do. That's just that's just what we like to do, you know, it's, yeah. it's just that simple. And yeah, that's a good point you brought up about so many bands sounding different back then because it wasn't like a, a blueprint yet. So there was like, there were some weird death metal bands out there, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, that weren't like what you'd hear today. You know, now everyone knows all the bands and a lot of bands are like, yeah, we sound, we're trying to sound like this and that band, stuff like that, which is fine. You know, do a good job and make it heavy. And just, it's your band, do whatever you want. It's yeah. cool. But, but, uh, yeah, it's just what we, what we like to play. You know, I'm sure there was some bleed over from death too, because it was such a, a big thing, not big as in popularity, but just in terms of, of like the music and how excited yeah. it, it was, you know? So, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure some of that influenced autopsy in the early days, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. We just kind of played what we wanted to hear for the most part. Yeah. Right. What about by then, was it still that same way in the Bay area? Like by the time, you know, you had like severed survival coming out and all that, or like, when did it start to change? Like scene wise, like around there with death metal, I think by that time there was things were starting to shift mm. and people were more, I mean, it was still very, very, very underground, you know, like our first gigs we played, you know, like, you know, sometimes we play and like 10 of our friends would show up and that'd be the show, you know, yeah. or uh, we did weird shit. Like we played before Danny got in the band, we played at an old abandoned bowling alley a couple times <laughs> um, that a friend of ours <laughs> cool. had access to for some bizarre reason and we, we played there and those are actually pretty fun like we got a, a few uh you know decent amount of people we played a lot of parties like house parties and shit okay. like that, house party slash rehearsal but yeah i think things were starting to to open up a little bit and and death metal was was uh i'm not gonna say it was cool because it, it still wasn't cool but it was getting cooler mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> you yeah, were just yeah. immediately a reject of society because you wanted to play it you know there's the people that were starting to to take notice and be like, Oh, maybe this, there's some, dare I say substance here, or at least some entertainment, yeah. you know, like we're not trying to change the world, just fucking get out there and get crazy, you know, come on. <laughs> so it, things are starting to broaden a little right. bit. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Were people thrown off when they would come see you guys live or whatever? And then they realized that you're doing the vocals and the drums. Cause at that time, God, I mean, there couldn't have been that many people doing that. No, not really. Um, I knew like King Fowley from deceased did it. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'm already running out of other examples. Um, <laughs> I'm sure there's some more I'm not thinking about. Did Mike Browning do when he was in Morbid Angel? Oh yeah, yeah he? he did vocals in the early yeah. Morbid Angel days. And there's there was a few bands like there was this band called Malfader okay. out of uh, I wanted, maybe DC or something like that. And I think their drummer did some vocals. They were cool. They were kind of like a thrash band though. Mm -hmm. But as far as people being thrown off, not really because. I know Eric and Danny and whoever was our bass player at that point always made it a point to to make it interesting being up front, knowing we didn't have like a just a standalone singer. So they would make it make a conscious effort to not just stand there and headbang, you know, be running around and yeah. you know, kinda like demand people's attention to fill the the lack of a, a singer. So no, it was it was never it was never anything weird or off putting that I've yeah, been aware right, of. Right, right. Yeah. So then when you guys went and did Severed Survival, which I think is still my favorite, it's tough, but there's just something about that one with this kind of, the energy that's in that thing that's like somehow captured. It's just like such a unique and like, to me, iconic, just like the way it was produced, the way, it, you know, everything was captured. Like, I don't know, man, I, that one, I think I go back and forth a lot, you know, I love it all, but I, I, that's just the one that I heard first and I go back to so much, but how did was it was it as far as the songwriting and getting ready for that i know you put the demo out before that and everything was it mostly you and eric doing that still or or how did it come together as far as like writing it and everything um danny wasn't writing yet so it was all stuff that eric and i had written a lot of it was was songs off the the two demos that we, we'd done it's like right. all three of the songs from the second demo were on there and then two of the songs off the first demo were on there and then the rest is just stuff that we wrote, like just for the sake of being on the on the album. I mean, we've been writing stuff before we knew we'd get a, an album contract. Although, of course, that's what every band always wants. Yeah. But we weren't we weren't writing for an album. We were writing just to write, you know, just to build up our our uh, arsenal, you know. But yeah. then, you know, once we found out we were going to actually get a recording contract, then we had to we had to write a couple more songs. I think we didn't have quite enough, so. 
we just like blazed out a couple more and and uh floundered with finding a bass player because we'd already been through a few by then uh so yeah eric and i had written everything danny hadn't had a whole lot of practices with us he was still Mm. not that he was new but we still didn't have a rehearsal room so we didn't it's not like we were jamming every week you know (laughs) anything like that it was like struggle you know so we had to make the most of of what we did get for for practices but yeah so yeah eric and i did write all that stuff now when you guys were writing together was it like were you just you know the the drum parts and doing that sort of thing were you doing stuff with a guitar or like were you doing certain drum parts and then eric would like you know I guess I'm what I'm trying to say is where you're writing things on the drums and then Eric would kind of go off that or vice versa or both or how was that looking? No, pretty much whoever had a song to present mostly wrote it home. Like I, I play guitar at home. So okay. I, I, that's how I, I do my writing. You know, I just put something together and, and play it for everybody. You know, back then, like, you know, where we make a cassette recording, like, here's my new song. Yeah. Um, Eric and I did collaborate on a, on a couple songs. I know like we actually sat down you know, in a garage or a bedroom or whatever with our guitars and like actually put riffs together. There's a few songs like that. Mm. Um, we don't really do that these days, which is kind of a bummer, but everyone's got like their own, you know, busy personal life yeah. and all that stuff. So we don't, we have a lot less hang time than we used to have, you know, right. back when we had <laughs> no responsibilities and no jobs and <laughs> yeah, we just do whatever sure. the fuck we wanted. So, I get it. Know. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but that's, that's how the writing went on, you know, just, sitting at home with guitars and putting stuff together. And okay. like if, if Eric had a song he wrote, he would play it for me and I would try and figure out drum, drum stuff that went well with it. You know, that kind of thing. Right. Are you pretty proficient? Like with the guitar? Have you been playing a long time? Obviously playing a long time. Uh, I mean, I've been, I mean, I've been playing guitar for 40 years, but I don't consider myself a guitarist. I, I primarily, yeah, I mean, I can play. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I, I rarely play for fun at home. It's more, it's mostly like a tool to write, write music with. But having said that, I, uh, I have played guitar. Um, well, I have this like hardcore band I play in called Violation Wound. And I actually, right. it's like a three piece band. I'm the guitar player, singer, and then we've got a bass player, drummer. And so we've played shows like that and recorded some albums. So, yeah. So yeah, I mean, I, I can play. So can obviously not like, play, yes. <laughs> yeah, I didn't realize like you did a, guitar in that band. I knew you were in that band. I didn't know you did guitar, so that's cool. Yeah, I mean, I'm not a virtuoso by any stretch, you know. Sure. But, uh, you know, but um, yeah, I know I, I can make it work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Now, like I said, you guys sound, you guys obviously have your own sound. I was talking about how, how natural it sounds. You know, you guys kind of have that. I don't know. It's, it's, it's loose in a way. How did you, how did you guys and how do you guys even still balance that you know staying loose keeping things natural and, and organic but not getting like full on not like not it's not sloppy like how do you keep that line how do you ride that line i think we just play like we play i mean we all grew up on rock too you know like before there was all this technically proficient death metal and whatnot and i don't know we've never wanted to be the most perfect band you know we're not we didn't want to be sloppy either. I mean, the, the funny thing is a lot of people talk about how our music is so primitive and caveman and all that. And it really isn't. If you listen to it, like there's some weird stuff in there in, in disguise as, as primitive caveman stuff. And we've got some weird, you know, time signatures and, and changes and, and stuff like that. It's kind of deceptive, you know, yeah. like there's, there's a lot more than, than meets the ear. If you, if you really listen, there's some, there's some, depending on the album, especially, you know, I mean, Severed Survival's probably got a little more rock and roll about it in terms of song structure. But as we went, we 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 got pretty weird. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> we still do some weird shit, but we also like to just kind of fucking rock too. So yeah, yeah. it just it just kind of comes back to playing what we like to play, and we we want to be tight. You know, we don't want to we don't want to suck. You know, right. we do try hard, and if we have something coming up, a show or recording, we'll practice our brains out. You know we'll go early in the morning or late at night or whatever it takes to get good. But, but we want to, we want to sound as good as we are. We don't want to, we don't want to sound better than we are. Yeah. So in other words, we don't use like any cheats okay. in the studio. We don't do triggers or like click tracks or samples. It's just like, it's just us playing. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. We, we love it too. You know? So I, 
we just want to we want people to hear it and be like, oh yeah, that's definitely a real band. There's no question about it. Oh yeah, I mean to me, it, like like you said, without the click track and things like that, where there is the possibility of like little variations and stuff like that, I feel like that makes it so much more listenable. Like you don't you don't get like the fatigue from it as well is easy. It's like you're even if you're not thinking about it or noticing all those things, it's just to me it's it's easier to listen to than something that's like all going to be exactly perfect. And, you know, it just doesn't sound as interesting, I guess, you know, for the long term. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a matter of personal taste. Some mm -hmm. people only like that stuff and don't like the more, uh, you know, organic stuff or whatever you want to call it. And so, you know, at the end of the day, it's personal taste, but that's for what sure. you like. For sure. Yeah. Now, you guys had, again, we're calling back to Steve again. <laughs> oh, sure. Uh, Steve was playing on this one. And that's one of the, like, the biggest things, too, is like people either, sometimes people don't like the heavy bass sound. I I love it, you know. Did, was that something you guys did just end up that way producer i know i've read in the past i can't remember kind of how that happened as far as the the louder bass sound well steve is such a good bass player we wanted him to be heard yeah so it was simple as that you know yeah. we're, we've never been afraid of bass yeah. right, right <laughs> you know some fans don't want the bass to be very prominent like it's just kind of like filler in the background and that's not you know we thought bass was cool like fucking you know geezer butler yeah, and stuff yeah. like that or steve harris or whatever i mean that's you wanted john ant whistle whatnot one of you know bass is important so we, we wanted to be heard and and uh it was also very we didn't have time to to really overly scrutinize anything i think we were in the studio for a total of four days like to do everything record mix wow. the works so it was like we didn't have time to to nitpick over little details it was just lam bam done yeah yeah that's cool though i think that just adds to it yeah it worked out it worked i mean we were happy with it you know we were super stoked and, yeah you know like you said it's a it's a love it or hate it thing for some people but um but yeah we were, we were very happy with it now were you still talking with like with chuck at this time like did he hear the album were you got you know were you guys in contact still that um a little bit actually we weren't in, in constant contact anymore like after after the it fell apart with me it kind of changed things you know because we we're hanging out all day every day and talking all all day every day for you know a year year and a half and then all of a sudden i was out of the picture and he was getting a new was, all of a sudden he had a new lineup so he was focusing on that yeah so you know we're still still friends and we we talked a little bit but not nearly as much but but we were still totally cool i remember coming out to florida on a family vacation and I just went and stayed at his house for a week at his same parents' house. Just I wasn't in the band anymore, but just we just hung out, you know. And it was it was like old times, you know. It was super cool. Yeah. So uh, and actually, I went to uh, rehearsal and watched him and his new band playing stuff for getting the music for spiritual healing together. They're playing in some storage unit, and so I went and hung out with them and met met those guys, and that was cool. So we're we're definitely on good terms, you know. Yeah. And then. Uh, that's cool. Actually, there's even more things that I, that I remembered. We played, Autopsy played with Death at Mil Milwaukee Melfest 3 mm. in, in 89, so we saw him there. And then they came around here on the, I think it was Individual Thought Patterns. The, oh, I think it was like 1990 at any rate, and uh, Death played over here, and we all went out and went to the show and hung out. So we were, we were cool, you know? Yeah. But he didn't. I don't think he said too much about uh, autopsy or anything like that. He was like yeah. doing his thing and we were doing our thing. Yeah, sure, sure. What did, did, off topic again, but what did you think about those later albums? Were you, were, did, could you get into those or was the style too different by that point? Or Oh, the death stuff? You know, yeah. it was... No, I, at first I didn't like it. I, I, liked, I liked leprosy and I liked spiritual healing, but I was also still kind of in the mindset of... It's it had to be heavy and brutal and fast, you know. Yeah. Like when it came to death metal, <laughs> and so honestly, I I kind of wasn't into that stuff. And then the later stuff, I was definitely not into. It just was not my my thing, right? You know, really. And uh, I probably even said new death sucks or something like that <laughs> at some yeah, point. Yeah, but yeah. it's so dumb because now I. You know, in in recent years, I've like collected all those albums, and I realized they're fucking fantastic. Sure. You know, I just was being a, like a knucklehead, <laughs> and it had to be fast and just straight up brutal. Otherwise, it wasn't for me. 
Yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> that's funny. You know, like when you first get death metal fever, it's like all that matters for quite some time. You're just like, oh, yeah. can't get enough. You know, but right? I changed <laughs> like a lot of things that I was rough on back then. A lot of the even the Bay Area thrash bands back then. I'm like, fuck that. <laughs> and then later, I'm like, oh, okay, that was actually really good. I just didn't want to. Yeah. <laughs> I just wasn't into it at that point. But yeah, everybody you know, things, does it. Things change. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> most well, at least most people come around to things later on. Some people can stick to that one mind forever, but uh, but yeah. Anyways, <laughs> yeah, that's fine. If that, if that if that works in your in your uh, day, then cool. Yeah, you like what you like, right? I mean, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, what? Uh, so you guys released the album. What was like? I don't know. What did Peaceful think, or like, what were I don't know the Zine saying at the time? Were people pretty into at the time you know I, i'm coming like i said i'm i come to the came to this stuff so much later i have no reference point for like what it was doing at the time oh yeah no it's cool man um yeah it, it went over pretty good um i don't remember much about sort of like reactions and stuff i know we were really busy just trying to to promote it we even like made our own flyers and, and put them in the mail for people to order through peaceville like I actually made like handmade flyers and xerox oh and nice cut them up and send them all over the place so we were trying to like promote it yeah because peaceville is still kind of new they were like pretty pretty underground still at that point yeah so we were like doing our part to you know push the record as much as we could um but it it went over good i don't i don't remember anything being a bummer about it yeah that that would probably would have stood out if like if everyone thought it sucked, I would remember that. You know, <laughs> right, so, right. But yeah. I think I think it went over pretty well, as, as best as I can recollect. Which I right. turned out, I guess, is not very much. Now, I've heard a lot over the years with you know some of the Swedish scene or the European death metal scene, like really latching on to you guys, um, especially Severed Survival, and or I guess I'm, I'm sure more than that, but. And it being quite a big influence on bands like Entombed and Dismember and. Uh, Oh God, I'm drawing a blank on some of the other ones that I remember reading about. But were you aware of that at the time? Or sorry, what'd you say? Uh, we, oh, Grave was another one. Yeah, um, I think. Well, we were all kind of like fans of each other's music, mm. you know. And I think mm-hmm. of, uh, some of us like fed off each other. Like I remember hearing the Nihilist demos before they were in tune. Yeah, and uh, that was you know like uh, I traded with Nike from from the, that band. We'd like anytime we did a new demo, we would send it to each other. Oh yeah, you know, and it was kind of like. I'm not going to say it was competition, but, you know, we'd, like we'd hear the new Nihilist demo and go, fuck, this is good. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. not that we want to sound like them or whatever, but it was healthy. Yeah. You know, so we, we were probably inspiring each other. I know we were stoked with all those bands. We played demos all the time. The, one of the funny thing is, like, a lot of bands talk about the guitar sound on Severed Survival, and that was totally an accident <laughs> because I think it was Eric... It didn't have an amp at the, at that point. I'm pretty sure. Okay. So what we did for his guitar, I had a PV bass amp. It was just like one speaker, I think like one 12 inch speaker that was actually my dad's that he used to play acoustic guitar through. <laughs> <laughs> and then Chuck had left behind his boss distortion pedal, the classic orange mm. pedal when he moved and he just left it here and asked him if he wanted me to mail it back to him and i don't remember what he said but he wasn't worried about it I, mean, I think he'd already bought another one or whatever so i yeah i had his old boss distortion pedal still with great bubble gum stuff stuck on it they put on there <laughs> and uh so we played <laughs> his old pedal through my dad's acu- bass amp oh, and man. that's how that guitar sound came from total by accident and wow. if, if you notice that no other album has that exact sound that we did because it was just the one right. thing for for seven survival and then i'm sure eric got like an amp after that for metal yeah. funeral and stuff so it was like a total fluke but uh man that is wild i don't remember that at all that's uh, <laughs> i think i told anyone that's so that cool before. how some of that kind of stuff happens yeah i think i think you're the first person i told about that because I, sometimes i just don't remember to mention things like that but yeah. but uh it was you know like a, a cool accident kind of thing yeah yes i mean sometimes that's the way that kind of stuff goes like it's just a happy accident you get a sound like that i mean yeah i mean well, I, I don't even remember no, go ahead. I was just going to say, if you don't have an amp, you got to figure something out. You're going into the <laughs> studio, so whatever it is, you got to do something. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And so I'm sure that kind of played into, uh, you know, some of those Swedish bands looking for that sound, I guess, a little bit. Yeah, I think so. That's cool. That's got to that's gotta feel cool to have that kind of uh, impact, you know. And like you said, you guys were impacting each other, so that's even even cooler, really. Oh, yeah, we were, we were fans of all those guys, too. Yeah, 
Yeah. Um, okay. So then you, mental funeral, you know, we get a pretty decent change in sound. I mean, it's obviously still autopsy. It just, to me, you know, a little bit slower, or, you know, a little more of the doom type stuff. Um, did it, did it change a lot writing wise when you, when you were, you guys were writing for mental funeral or just pretty much the same process wise as severed? Oh, just same process. Just, just writing the heaviest stuff we can come up with. Yeah. You know, we didn't talk about yeah. changes in style or anything like that at all. It was just kind of like, just more stuff, you know, just like, all just right. like changing listening habits or like better, you guys was better at playing or anything um, like that or no, not really. I mean, we, we listened to whatever still, whatever the heaviest stuff that we could find was, you know, whether it was older or newer stuff like that, but no, yeah, we just wanted to be as, as brutal and heavy as possible. Really. That's, that's always the goal. Just brutal and heavy as possible. Yeah. Right, 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 right. What, uh, you guys went some, do you guys go somewhere else to produce this one or was it same or recorded or same? Yeah, no, we went somewhere different. We went to, well, we went to, for Cyber Survival, we went to a place called Starlight, which we heard of because, uh, Sadis had recorded their first album there. And then uh, our buddies, Hex, they had recorded there as well. Um, and us three bands were like super tight back then. We played parties together and stuff like that. And so we like copied a lot of their ideas, you know, because we didn't, we didn't know where studios were or anything like that. We were just like, oh, say this next one there. Let's go there. But um, for Metal Funeral, we went to a place called Different Fur mm. in San Francisco. And we'd gone there before. So we did an EP called Retribution for the Dead. That was between Sword Survival and Mental Funeral. And I, I had an idea to go to Different Fur because I was and still am a big fan of the Residence. And, I, you know, looking at Residence album liner notes, I saw they recorded a lot of stuff for Different Fur. And so I looked them up in the phone book, you know, pre-internet. So I, I found their phone number somehow and called them up and booked some studio time. And, uh, we went there and it was cool. It was it was, was a it? great place to go. Oh yeah, it was fantastic. It was cool because we pulled up to the building and the first thing we saw is this like residence kind of artwork, you know, painted on the side of the <laughs> building. The pornographics, um, choose your spelling depending on each residence release. But uh, we knew it was going to be cool. Like okay, this is going to be fucking cool. Yeah, and it was. Yeah, so yeah, different different environment entirely. Did you guys spend much more time on that one? I mean. Or, or, or you, cause you said of like four days for cyber. Did you have more time at all for, for, for this one? Yeah, I think we, I think we were there for probably close to a week. Oh, okay. Still but not too much. It's, no, I mean, we, we never go in the studio for too long, but there, it was, it's funny because cyber survival, we got a budget of, I think it was five, four or $5,000 and legend has it. And the legend is true that your infinite wisdom we spent half of the budget literally half the budget on weed so like two thousand dollars worth of weed in fucking 1989 didn't tell the label you know they yeah. just didn't ask for a receipt or invoice they're just like here's the money to make your record like wow. well, buy a lot of weed with this which we did and that left us with four days worth of time to make the severed survival which we did and then yeah. hammy who ran peaceville i think he found out what we did so he, he made it a point to come out and be with us for mental funeral. Okay. I think with the idea to sort of like babysit us to make sure we were, we were good boys. Yeah. But Hammy being Hammy, next thing you know, he was just part of the party and we were fucking <laughs> cut, cutting pretty loose on that album, you know, like drinking and just smoking. And next thing you know, Hammy smoking a fucking PPP join the bong and you know it was like that it was like i think there was it's funny because it's true uh yeah. i think there was like 18 of us in the studio for that oh like we're just God. like we just let all our friends come and hey it was like that album doesn't sound like a party it sounded like no. anything but a party but it was a party in the studio for real how did you get anything done with that that sounds insane yeah it was insane uh i you know I, I, that was we didn't really drink much during severed survival we had a couple of beers you know but yeah then something happened between then and mental funeral we really started to embrace the drinking in the <laughs> studio too and i do i have i don't remember the recording of the album very much but i i remember getting ready to start the first song telling myself oh shit i'm kind of drunk i've never <laughs> been like this in the studio i hope hope i can do this and then we just went in and fucking 
we just blazed through everything and it was great that's i'm not saying this is a good way to do things but that's what we did it worked out fine obviously yeah yeah it did yeah (laughs) (laughs) did you i mean that's funny did you were you like well we're gonna do this next time it worked or did you guys cut back (laughs) no we we just got worse (laughs) 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 we just we just uh ratcheted it up even more (laughs) as uh releases went on and then once we, well, no, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but, uh, I mean, we, we always got the job done though. I mean, we, you know, we weren't that much at delinquents, you know, we, we still, no matter what went down in the studio, we always showed up super prepared, super rehearsed mm. because we never had like big budgets. We couldn't do like some bands be in the studio for months and just like hone our craft. Yeah. You know, we had to just get in there and blaze it out and get out, you know, cause time is ticking, you know, and time yeah. is money in the studio. So we, we couldn't not show up prepared, otherwise albums would have not been completed. That makes sense, too. I mean, you can hold it down. If, if you guys are that well prepared and then you're partying in the studio, at least you are, you already know what you're doing. I mean, at that point, it's, uh, yeah, just, just oh, keeping yeah. it together. <laughs> it's not like we're, like, passing out and throwing up and, you know, fucking anything like that. We were just, you know, having fun. Yeah, I just love the fact that uh, the peaceful guy comes down and then he's drawn into it. <laughs> oh, yeah, like, well, uh, Hammy's a partier, like a you know, so he was, uh, you know... His his visit out here was was uh you know colorful. There was couldn't resist partying and mushrooms and all all sorts of things <laughs> going on. Oh, that's funny. That's funny. Um, all right. Ah, shit, I know we're already at an hour here, so I don't want to keep you here. Um, I want to touch at least on shit fun because <laughs> I feel like this album is I I love this album. I mean, I and I do hear you know you'll hear both sides of this one, but man, people either totally hate this one or will be or defend it i'm defending it i mean obviously we've got this cover you know and obviously that's going to throw people i think that's that's a polarizing point right there just to cover i think that that's responsible for turning people off probably even more yeah than the, than the music you know and i get that you know i mean i do i do wonder what we were thinking <laughs> you know honestly but it had to happen you know yeah so it happened yeah. yeah that's what i was gonna ask you like is that what it comes down to because if you give it a chance if you take if you just listen if you're just listening to it i mean i don't know how you wouldn't like i mean you're it's still autopsy obviously you guys did some different stuff on it you know but um but man i mean there's some great 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 songs on there do you guys ever play any of that live we have we played um not lately we, we played a couple songs off it like towards the very very end of the band and when we got back together, we played, we played, uh, we played a couple songs off it. Not like a whole bunch, but like a couple of the really short songs we did. Yeah, like I mean, we want to represent it. You know, when we got yeah. back together, not pretend like we didn't do it. You know, because we felt like we wanted to touch on a little bit of of everything. Yeah. When we played live, so so that was important. So yeah, we we have played not a lot off it, but some. You know, yeah. I mean, uh, got to got at least touch on it. I feel like that's cool. I I like that. I mean. Uh, I know I saw Morbid Angel recently, and they were they played like a, a bunch of songs off their like least favorite album. Well, not the least favorite, but Heretic is a lesser known, or people don't like that one as much. And I felt like they were kind of trying to be like, "Hey, wait a minute, there's some good songs on here." So I was like, "Man, I wonder if Autopsy does that for for shit fun." Because if you actually listen and don't worry about the cover or whatever, I mean, <laughs> yeah, there's some fucking strong songs on there. It's a it's a gnarly yeah. album, man. It's 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 a. Uh on the rare occasion when I listen to it, it, I feel gross when it's over with, you know, it's like, ah, <laughs> yeah. I need to scrub my brain off with a steel wool pad now. Or something. Oh yeah. 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 It's, it's, I mean, I'm not going to deny that. It's a definitely a fucked up album, but it's it part is. of the, uh, it's part of it, man. It's, you don't get an album like that every day, you know? No, nor should you. <laughs> All right. Let's end on this. You got, well, I'm going to throw two things real quick. Sure. Morbidity, morbidity triumphant. Um, was was extremely sick. That one came out, I think, last year. It is. Yeah, you guys got Greg Wilkinson on that one, who I'm a fan of. Oh, cool. Yeah did uh, did that change much for you guys with having him in the band? I don't know if he you know was involved in the songwriting or anything, but he yeah he wrote one of the songs on there. Okay. Um. Yeah. Yeah. It was it was great getting him in the band. That was probably really healthy for us. You know, just. And he's he's a he's a killer ace player, you know, for one thing, and just his attitude is is so good, you know. He's like a really kind of upbeat, super uh, positive personality, you know. It's it's just really good for the chemistry of the band, you know. Yeah. He's having a great time, and he's and he's just uh, 
ready to do it all. You know, it's an infectious, you know, like, oh man, Greg's really yeah. into it. This is cool. So it kind of, you know, makes you feel the same way. So yeah, it's, it's, it's great, man. He's, you know, plus he's a recording engineer. That's pretty cool too. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it was, it was, it was, a, it was a good move getting him in the band. We're, we're still very happy about that. Yeah, that's cool. No, I'm always so surprised when, when a band like you guys have been around for so long and then I'll, I'll listen to a newer album and I'm always a little bit hesitant, you know, cause you listen to the classics, you listen to the older stuff and then you're just like, I don't know, are they still going to do it? But yeah, it's so awesome to hear like when you guys, when a band like you guys puts out an album like that, where it's like, yep, you know, it's still, it's still there. Like I'm trying to think of that. My favorite one in there that the skin, skin to skin or skin from skin, oh, skin by or, skin. Yeah. Yeah, man. Just, I mean, just great, you know, just as great as anything before it, you know? Oh, thanks. That's uh that's uh from the, the mind of Eric. It's a pretty bizarre one there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I love it. I love cool, it. Cool, um, thanks. And then Siege of Power, man, you guys, this was a di- completely different, obviously band, but you guys put out an album this year. I know you're doing the vocals on that. I don't think you're playing drums in this band, right? No, just vocals only. And, and what's his name from? Hail of Bullets? Oh, uh, we got Theo, and then uh, Paul, who's um, also in Asphyx, and then we got Bob, who was in Asphyx, and is doing some other stuff. So kind of like, man, I've known Bob since, you know, like late 80s when he in Asphyx was just doing demos. So, uh, you know, like buddies from, from uh, way back. Yeah, I, I love it, man. And I love hearing, I love hearing you do like... Uh, I haven't paid attention to everything you've done, you know, other than autopsy. I've listened to some of the other stuff, but as far as on this one, like just like a, a lot of different stuff vocally where I almost was like, is this, is, is this still Chris doing vocal? I mean, did you, you did it all on your own? Yeah. 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 I, I just wanted to each song to have vocals that suited the riffs, you know, it's cause if it was, if the vocals were the same on every song, I think it would have been less effective. Mm-hmm. They gave me like a pretty good assortment of, of riffs and, and styles, you know, yeah. So I wanted the vocals to reflect that and, and treat each song like its own little thing instead of just like, oh, I'm going to do everything the same and get it done. You know, I put a, I put a lot of care into to each individual song. Yeah, you can tell. And that's I think you're exactly right on with that because I remember I listened to the first song and I was like, I think, th- is this is this what we're going to get for the whole album? And then it was just like, I was it was like surprise after surprise. Oh, cool. And uh, yeah, man, I mean, like a lot of that came down to just like I said, the vocals where I was like, is that still Chris? Because that just sounds like a, a different person. I didn't know you, you know, I just didn't, I mean, I hear all your different stuff on autopsy, but it was even more different, you know, on this. And it was, so that was cool to hear, man. I really like that. Oh, I'm glad you like it. Thank you, man. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. So I wanted to at least uh, touch on that. So everybody needs to definitely, definitely listen to that one. Um, but man, I appreciate it. I'm not going to take any more of your time. I, I had other stuff, but I'm going to leave it there. <laughs> you can always do a uh, part two later if you want. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Exactly, man. Well, yeah, have a good uh, good rest of your day, man. And uh, hopefully talk again some other time. Sounds good. Super cool talking to you, man. That was great. <laughs>